Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last of our series for this winter. And we saved Vince Turner for the last because he's wonderful. We're going to hear about World War II on the Potomac. I have a little housekeeping to do before we get started. Please turn off your cell phones. I saw a mayor here. Where's Mayor Mahoney? Oh, you're hiding from me. I always like to introduce and thank our elected officials. Mayor Mahoney, just raise your hand. And I, we always thank Mickey Hummel, who is town council member. We really could not have these lectures without Mickey helping us because he is an IT guru and I don't ever have to worry about something stopping, not moving, breaking, or anything because he's here to help us. I want to thank our sponsors. We have the Bayside History Museum, our Calvert Library, and the John Hanson Daughters of the American Revolution. And here's coming another one of our town council members. This is Larry Jaworski. <laughs> Welcome in the door. And Larry is Chesapeake Beach Town Council. Okay. After the talk, if you haven't already purchased one of our local books about North Beach, see me in the back where that yellow bag is. It's $25, and we would be honored to sell you a book. And this is the fundraiser for our Bayside History Museum. So without further ado, Vincent, there's five chairs up here. They don't want to sit up in the front. <laughs> they don't want to take confession. <laughs> Give me one more minute so they can get seated. Okay, it's a real honor today to introduce Vince Turner. The town of North Beach and Chesapeake Beach welcomes back our living historian, Vince Turner. He's an architect of many exhibits honoring America's military heritage. He's a resident of Owens, where he lives with his wife, Vicki, and his youngest daughter, Olivia. He's a volunteer with his son, Vincent. Where's Vincent? Oh, Vincent's sitting back there. At Fort Mott State Park in Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Pennsville, thank you. He is recognized specialist in document records management. He works as a contractor with the federal government on aerospace programs. Vince? Wow. Um, that's my press agent, Grace Mary Brady. <laughs> President of the Bayside History Museum with her today is uh, Vincent Pete Turner II, uh, Vice President of the Museum and an inspiration to me. I'm catching my breath here because I came in here, I, I'm just, I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here today. This is the culmination of years of reading and collecting and, and I have the opportunity to share with you. But somebody shared with me on the way in today and, and the gentleman touched my heart with a story of a man that he knew uh, and a very important episode that happened during World War II was the liberation of one of the concentration camps. I've met a lot of veterans. Um, we have the pleasure of working with veterans. If you're a veteran, please raise your hand. Thank you. um, you're, you're why we do this. Um, if you've never been in uniform, sometimes it's hard to realize the sacrifices of our men and women in uniform and their families. So with that, um, I want to thank Sarah Saunders from over in St. Mary's County. Uh, she was the one that planted the seed for the title of our um, presentation today, World War II on the Potomac. Um, great lady, uh, works over at Piney Point and uh, St. George's Island Museums. Now, there were two other people, and I'm, I'm doing some prefacing here so you understand the context of what we're going to talk about today, right? So, by show of hands, how many people have at least some insight onto the Second World War? All right, that's good. How about the Potomac? Does everybody know where the Potomac is? <laughs> okay. All right, just making sure. Well, we're going to have some geography today, and we're going to have some history today. Um, but i got to tell you, my, my son, he's getting ready to graduate master's program, University of Maryland. And the Dean's List, right? Now, this is one sharp cookie. And this is the guy that I talk to when I say, 
I'm putting together something and I need perspective. And he's the one that said, don't make it technical and put it in context. And that's very good advice. And that's why he asked who has familiarity with some of the subtitles he's going to talk today. Also want to thank my wife, who's a major influence on me, and not just because we're married, because she's come to every presentation this year and she's debriefed me. She said, here's, here's what I liked and what I, she didn't say I didn't like anything. She just said, just remember, not everybody knows the material as well as you do. So put it in the context that they're going to understand your story. But it's not really my story. It's a story of Washington and the region. And, and we're going to actually going to start with a little bit of a ge uh, geology here. <coughs> so the Potomac River flows. People differ on the numbers. I've seen many different numbers. We decided on 405. Okay. 405 miles from the highlands of West Virginia to where it flows into the Bay of Point Lookout. It drains Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, District of Columbia. Where you live, work, and play on the Potomac River influences your perspective of what the river is. And the reason is, I have lived along just about every section of the river or had the pleasure to cruise it or fish it or play in it, actually only upstream. Um, so it goes through mountain valleys, it goes through farmland, it goes over the Great Falls. If you, has anybody here been to the Great Falls in Virginia? What a spectacular sight, right? And then it drops out and it broadens out into a tidal river as it flows onto the bay. That's a lot of ground to cover. And it's important we understand the geology because we only have 40 some odd minutes together today. So I can't cover the whole river. So anybody, is there anybody here from above Great Falls, Hagerstown, Cumberland, anywhere around that area? Okay, we got a couple people, Frederick, yes, okay. No offense, Ted, <laughs> we're going to have to leave that part of the river for another day. All right, we're going to focus on the area from uh, Carter Rock, which is adjacent to Great Falls, down to St. Indigo's, which is just upriver from Point Lookout. And the reason we're going to do that is because, again, we have a lot to cover today. Um, World War II in miniature. The reason I ask if you have familiarity with it, this is just the highlights. And this is really the highlights from uh, America's involvement. Japan invades China mainland, 1937. Germany invades Poland, 1939. Naval, uh, naval era and sea forces of the Empire of Japan bombed the island of uh, Oahu, territory of what? It was a territory back then, by the way. Territory of Oahu, December 7th, December 8th, we declare war on them. December 11th, three days later, we declare war on Germany and Italy, and then they declare war on us. Right? So it's like, who slapped who? Um, Italy surrenders in 1943, okay? But Germans are occupying the country. They continue to fight to the end of the war. June 6th, 1944, very important date. D-Day landings in Normandy, the beginning of the liberation of Germany uh, and, and the European continent. Liberation of Germany, defeat of Germany, liberation of the European continent. May 8th, VE Day. Does anybody remember VE Day? No one's that old? Okay, it's all good. <laughs> all right, it was on May 8th, 1945. Um, August 6th, the uh, dropping of the first atomic bomb on Japan, and then Japan formally surrenders on September 2nd, 1945. So that's the war in miniature. That's the time frame that we're going to be working in today. Did you know? Before the attack on Pearl Harbor, most people in this country said, I don't want to fight in Europe again. <coughs> and a lot of this came out of our involvement in the First World War. Okay? There were treaties that were signed afterwards. There were arms limitations. Um, and what happened is that the Great Depression and the aggression of the Japanese Empire in the Third Reich of Germany basically negated all treaties by 1935. And then the United States said to itself, you know, we got to catch up here. And the reason for that is that if we look at the numbers, and again, the numbers differ somewhat depending on your, your uh, resource that you're referencing. 334,500 persons in the United States Armed Forces, that's combined services, at the beginning of the war in 1939. We're the 17th largest army in the world behind Portugal. Does anybody know where Portugal is? Yeah. Have you seen the size of Portugal? Right? And they have a bigger army than us. Okay. But that does not mean that there were not things going on, and there was a lot going on on the Potomac River. We're going to talk about that today. Now, just in case you're wondering, 
And I got to tell you, Walter Cronkite's book on Washington during the war was, is just a really good reference because we're not going to talk politics today. But I'll leave you with this thought. It was very part, bipartisan back then, okay? Very polarized back then, despite what we want to think from what we see and read now Hollywood's presented the times, right? Bad news is, not everybody liked FDR. Mm -hmm. All right, population of Washington nearly doubles during this time. And some of these places are not on the Potomac, but the representative of Federal, Federal Housing Administration um, housing that was built to house war workers. We see this major influx. The draft comes back in 1940. All these people are coming into Washington to support this buildup. We're not in it yet. We're doing Lend-Lease. We're trying to help the Allies out, right? But we're putting them in trailers. We're putting them in new housing. There was a lady who um, wrote into the Facebook page uh, for the Bayside History Museum and said, I think that picture's in Greenbelt. And guess what it is? <laughs> I love this picture at the top. 265 feet long, 75 room. I'm going to do a real estate pitch here, right? That at Pier 4 in the uh, Washington Channel, you too can get a room for the duration. Okay? All you got to do is sign up and pay a uh, monthly fee. Love the pictures on the bottom. This is the lily ponds. They're very similar to the flat tops that used to be down at Pax, around the Pax River area back during the Second World War. I think there's one left, and it's not even near the base anymore. They moved it upstream. Uh, I think there's a roofing company in it now. But anyway, uh, postmodern, very quick to build, okay? And these were not designed by second-rate architects, okay? There were some very prominent Washington architects who were involved in designing these. They had to go up quickly. They had to go up in multiple places. If you look throughout the region and you look at historic photographs, you're going to see, other than the barge, you're going to see a lot of housing looks very similar to this. Some of it is still around today. I think there's still some units over in uh, Falls Church that, I, that I'm familiar with, and also in Suitland. All right, what you see, what you hear, what you read. There's no internet, there's no cable TV, there's no cell phones, okay? Everything is heavily filtered or influenced by the federal government. This comes out of um, the federal government's involvement during the First World War, all right? Most of your news is going to come through three basic methods. There are daily newspapers, okay? In some cases, they print a morning and an evening edition up in Washington, right? Down here, I think we still have a weekly going on, okay? Um, you're going to go to the news uh, newsstand, and you're going to see periodicals like Time and Life, and they're going to bring you your war news, and they're going to influence what you think about the war, and how you engage the war and support the war. And the other way is radio. Now, broadcast journalism just finished up a really good book about the early days of broadcast journalism. It's in its infancy. It is not like it is today. Radio is not even on 24 hours a day. It signs on at 6 o'clock in the morning in most cases, goes off the air at 10, 11 o'clock at night. Okay? So you can't stay up all night and watch TV to get your news or listen to the radio. And everything's AM, which Works well on a good night, okay, but when you have atmospheric interference, good luck getting the news out. Um, the books you read are heavily influenced. A lot of things the government censored so much that they were not even allowed to go into publication. And that's a whole other story for a whole other day, and we actually have another exhibit on that. All right, so you're living in the region. Let me tell you a little bit about Washington and the environs at the time. It's considered a very southern town, okay? Southern mores, um, southern way of life, um, blacks and whites don't live together, they don't work together, discrimination is even prominent in the federal government and how the federal government treats the citizens of the region. This is on both sides of the river. This is D.C., this is Maryland, and this is Virginia. And in some cases, the expansion of the military actually displaced blacks over whites. And when I was putting this together, I said, you know, this is a very hard topic for me because when I was in the service, what we were taught is everybody's green. Okay? So for today, everybody's green. 
but it's a story we need to tell. All right. So uh, most of the pictures we had, because there weren't, there weren't a lot of photographers coming out to Southern Maryland, okay. And Virginia, for some reason, we have a really hard time getting into their archives. Um, we're still working on it. So this is like this is like phase one for this presentation, all right? So DC probably has more, was probably photographed more than anywhere else in the world, except for the war zones, right? Uh, but in this country. So imagine you're living in DC, and guess what? There are blackouts. So the first year, year and a half of the war, um, you're basically turning off the lights. If you've been to DC at night, right? You know how bright it is? Okay, well just imagine with the lights off. They'd keep the street lamps on, okay? You had to dim your headlights. They had, actually had special, you could get tape when they had a conversion kit to cover your headlights, right? But the idea was everybody was frantic that the Germans would launch an airborne attack against the mainland U.S. Now, I would love to regale you with stories of ships clashing on the Potomac and the repelling of armies by the Armed Forces of the United States, but guess what? didn't happen here. But there was a lot going on. Civil defense drills. Okay? Everybody learned. I'm going to use the terms everybody just to be representative because the numbers don't exist. Okay? But the idea is that you want to train everybody on various aspects of civil defense. What to do in case of a fire. What to do in case of an incendiary charge falling into your house or into the street. How to do basic first aid. How to mobilize people to transport them to other places to seek first aid. And this is a photograph, um, matter of fact, there's a connection between the gentleman referenced here and some people that visited the uh, museum this past week, but we're not going to digress today, we're going to keep moving forward. Um, but this is just demonstrating treatment of air raid victims, there are a lot of pictures of the war during the war that were taken that are similar to this nature, right? And air raids. Now when I was growing up, we had fallout shelters in D.C. It was the black and yellow signs. Anybody else remember those? Okay, some of you. Um, this one, it's sort of hard to see, but it was the only period picture I could find. And this is Catholic University. And that little sign, so I can use this, right there, says there's a shelter in this building. So if they call the air raid siren, the idea is to get underground. Okay? And that's the place you want to go. This right here, you can actually still find them. In DC, there were a couple of them still out there in a couple of old, older federal buildings. That's a siren. When I was living in DC in the 1960s, they would still do uh, weekly drills to make sure that the sirens worked. I don't know if they still do that. I don't know if anybody even pay attention there. Okay, but this is something that uh, continued to occur through the Cold War and up to uh, the fall of Germany. I'm, I'm going to assume I moved out of DC in '68 for reasons we won't discuss today. But first and foremost, I love this picture, by the way. This is not from a horror picture. This is to emphasize the fact that during an air raid, during an emergency, don't get excited. Keep your head. All right, defending the nation's capital. Uh, we have a couple guys back here from a study group that I belong to, the Coast Defense Study Group, so they can probably tell you more about these two weapons than I can. But what you see here is an Acme News Service photo that was reprinted in the Washington Post. It's a... Um, Soldiers on top of the government printing office, 1944, with a 40-millimeter anti-aircraft gun. So imagine driving around the city and looking up, and on top of all these federal buildings, you have real or you have uh, fake, and we actually have some pictures over here, uh, fake anti-aircraft guns. So as late as 1944, we're still concerned about the possibility of Germany uh, conducting an aerial raid on, on uh, Washington, D.C. Now, the picture to the right, there's actually... Um, two instances of this. So what we see here, it's the uh, 90 millimeter position. These actually ring Washington, D.C. It has this grass mat. So if you want to camouflage it from the air, you just pull this over, right? Now, what's interesting is, how would you like to wake up one morning and find the 90 millimeter anti-aircraft gun position in your front yard, right? Did somebody say yes? <laughs> I might be able to accommodate you. I know where one's at. All right, a um, lot of words. Bottom line is, this was a wonderful reference. If you can find a copy and even take a picture of it over here, this was invaluable. And I gotta tell you, the Maryland Historic Trust did this state a service back in 1950, 
when they put this volume together. It's been indispensable because I'm the kind of guy that says, if there was a phone booth that belonged to the Navy at the end of the boardwalk, I want to know about it, right? So they list all of these places, 19 Army installations, four Coast Guard stations, 30 Naval installations offices in the state of Maryland that they actually provided biography of, along with 126 other small offices, maintenance, repair, and service units across all branches of the Armed Forces state of Maryland. That's a big number. We're not going to visit them all today. We just don't have time. And we even had to um, take some out this week. So I'm like one on the clock here going, we're never going to get through this in 45 minutes. So if I miss your favorite today, I apologize. It's not intentional. And you can remind me later, we'll compare lists. The other thing I want to tell you too is that um, I've been collecting this stuff forever. Not just to have it, but it, the history means a lot to me. Regional history, World War II history, history of the veterans. If you have a story, if you have photos, you have anything you want to share related to today's topics, please get in touch with me. Great, where's Grace Mary at? Oh, there she is. Grace Mary, would you be amenable that if somebody wanted to get a hold of me, they could get a hold of you to get a hold of me through the museum? Bring it by the museum. They'll get it. You'll get it. Or you can get my contact information from Grace Mary, right? Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. I was just looking. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, wonderful people over there. So anyway, we're going to attempt to visit. This is going to be like Animaniacs. Anybody remember Animaniacs? These guys would get on a tangent and they'd just get on a tear and they'd just go through stuff so quick you couldn't you'd make your head spin. We're going to try to do 21 of these installations on or near the Potomac in, oh, let's see, 23 minutes. I know, I laughed too when I said that. <laughs> All right, here's a little map we ginned up this week. Um, it's got a blue dot, it's Navy, Army, Marine Corps, multi-branch, and Washington National Airport's on here because it had a major impact on transportation with, um, within the region. We're going to start up at Carter Rock. Anybody ever been to the David Taylor model base on Reviat? Okay. So again, it's an introduction. Okay, we're not going to get into all the details. There's actually a really great book over here if you want to read about the model basin. Take your picture of the book. Most of the installations actually have had good histories written about them and you can read more about it. But for today, we're going to say, started off in uh, 1939 to replace the experimental model basin that was down at the Navy Yard, which had been around since 1899. It was rather decrepit, falling apart. And it actually had a tendency to flood during heavy rains. So they moved it up to Carter Rock because it was granite. It was a heavy... Um, uh, the, they were able to get a good foundation, which you need if you're going to be, build this large facility, which ended up being almost a half a mile long, <clears throat> filled with water. And water weighs a lot, right? So you have to have a stable platform to build on. Over here on the right is a press photo that shows them building these wooden holes. And the, the description of it in the book is just, these guys were just master mechanics. And building these scale models, the idea was that they would build scale models and they would test out these holes in the model base. And what you see here is the mechanism that they would drag the hole through the water, right, to test the hydrodynamics of it. See if it was even feasible, uh, feasible to go forward with fabricating and putting the holes in the production. Um, later in the war, they actually tested torpedoes at the facility. They had a um, wind tunnel. And there's a really good photograph out there of troops that were stationed in Washington billeted on the grounds of the David Taylor Model Basin. It's still there today, by the way. I used to drive by it all the time. All right, Fort Meyer, what can you say? This Sentinel of the Potomac has been there forever. Um, if you're not really sure where it's at, if you know where the uh, Marine Corps Memorial is, it's right next door. Been there since, uh, basically it was created out of two um, forts, Whipple and Cass. Now we're around part of the defense of the Washington during the American Civil War. Signal school, sig, I'll be okay. Uh, signal school started here in 1869, became a cavalry post. That's what most people remember it for. Um, but during the Second World War, it was a um, processing station. So soldiers going overseas were processed through Fort Myer if they were from the region. The Army Band was posted here in 1942. Uh, 2005, it merges next door with Henderson Hall, which we're also going to talk about today, to become Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall because these. Names or these installations are just not long enough. Um, 
the, the two pictures, now I could not find a good period picture of Fort Meyer because it was rather expansive, but what we do have here is someone who's demonstrating Sigma Four School. Still at Fort Meyer, that's the brand new walkie talkie he's demonstrating right there. The caption on the bottom, I included this picture because the cavalry actually converted over to um, armor, okay, and they had scout vehicles, so they're actually testing out a Bantam Jeep, and I just love the caption. We're ready for action are these rough riding hard-boiled members of the Jeep crew of Fort Myers, Virginia. Okay, and that's the OWI at work right there. All right, Henderson Hall, 1941. David built a temporary um, office building. Space is at a premium. We talked earlier about how we're going to handle all these war workers, right? Well, we don't even have a place to put the federal workers, okay? They're working on top of each other. Marine Corps moves into the building in 1941. Um, the really cool thing about this place, okay, it's not just the fact it's still there, but it was a major staging center for the Women's Marine Company that was organized there. There's a whole uh, website about women veterans that talks in depth about this. One of the few pictures we could actually find from the period which shows Henderson Hall itself, which is the buildings in the back, are the female Marines passing in review. So uh, for female veterans, thank you very much for your service. You're as big a part of the picture as, as everybody else. Um, it had everything. It's 23 acres, full contingent, right there along the banks of the Dome. Now, your reading is I'm talking, right? Okay, because I don't want to have to read the slides to you. I don't mind. Don't cry. It gets better. I think he likes the story. All right, um, if you saw the original flyer, which for some, uh, there were problems with the color of saturation on it. But anyway, this is them clearing the site for the Pentagon. Right now, earlier I was talking about displacement, and this was actually built over the an area of Virginia that um, uh, African Americans lived in. It was one of their communities. Um, it was considered a slum, and they're like, "Let's just plow it under, and we're going to put the building here." Okay, um, 280 acres. The site occupies this huge space on the um, Virginia side of the Potomac. Now, that's the before. Okay. Let's take a look at the after, All right? Now, I've heard since 9-11 they've moved the roads um, on this side out uh, this way. But I can tell you, I used to um, actually go downtown um, in one of my jobs and work with the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. I hated driving to that building. I mean, look at the road system on this, right? Um, but at the time, largest office building in the world, okay? Still the center of military activity in the United States. And, you know, they do tours. So if you get an opportunity, it's worth a visit. Okay, Washington National Airport. See that big spot right there in the middle of the river? Mm -hmm. All right, well, this is what the area looked like before they built the airport. Mm -hmm. Right off of Gravelly Point. Mm -hmm. um, matter of fact, somebody was, I think it was, Vincent was telling me a story this week um, about they're having some issues with uh, foundations out there now because of how how this thing was built, right? So they're going to have they're, they're trying to do some some mitigation out there. Um, but this is what the area looked like in 1930, and here's what it looked like in 1941 after completion. Little story I want to share with you. I understand. I'm not old enough to remember this, but I understand that people used to go sit in the lounge on the observation deck and watch the planes take off and land. You did, okay. And I just think that's such a neat story because we hate going to the airport nowadays, <laughs> right? It's like, why would I want to go to the airport? Well, I got to travel, and that's about it. But it, it used to be a destination, okay? Back before TSA and all the other bad things, that, uh, you know. Um, just the building, building up of this. I mean, they had to pump in sand from the river, raise everything 20 feet above flood level, right? Just to get it, and you're sitting there going, why would you want to go through all that to build an airport here, okay? The bottom line is, there was nowhere else to put it. The old airport, which was actually further to the uh, northwest, Hoover, right, used to flood, and it had a major road that ran through it. So if you were going to take off in a plane, you had to stop the traffic. So like, this is just not going to work, okay? And that's one of the major reasons, plus we needed a better airport, uh, that they built Washington National, which is now Reagan National. Uh, Marine Barracks, Washington, D.C. I included this for a couple reasons. One, my uncle was stationed there. Uh, 
Master Sergeant Tau Talagia Satoa Numero, real name by the way. Um, seven tours Nam, three tours Korea. I just, out of respect, I know it's not on the river, but I said on or near. Um, it is near the river. Um, again, really hard to find period photographs, but the bottom line is this is where they used to train the Marines. Um, still the ceremonial center of the Marine Corps. Um, this photo down here is uh, more recent. Let me find the right button. But the footprint, and this is the Commandant's house, by the way, the footprint is still the same as when they built it out in the 1800s. So if you ever get a chance, um, they used to do tours, I'm not sure, but the architecture is just phenomenal. Um, there's a really good book on the uh, history of it. It's worth checking out. Leslie J. McNair was originally the Washington Arsenal. And why, why does that name, Washington Arsenal, sound so familiar? Anybody want? I know Mr. Chomet knows the answer. Anybody else? All right, so after, um, after the conspirators with John Wilkes Booth were arrested, this is where they were housed and hung. Okay? So when you hear Washington Arsenal, it's actually Leslie J. McNair now. It was named, uh, renamed. But I like this picture because it shows you, there's, a, there's some really, um, whoops, we didn't want to do that, we wanted to use this one. So what we have over here is the Anacostia Naval Air Station, we have the Navy Yard here, and we have McNair here in Army War College. What I love about these period photos is it still looks dense, but there is so much open area in the Washington region at this time that to compare the photographs from this period with today, you almost get disoriented. Shorelines have changed, things have built out, the facilities have even expanded, right? A lot of these facilities are still here, okay? But I mean, we're also gonna see a picture of three, three installations, right? Two Navy, one Army, sitting back. I mean, they don't get along that well in real life. <laughs> okay, the Washington Navy Yard. What can I say, right? 1799, one of the oldest installations in the country. What I love for the, whoop, go back. Ah, sorry about that. Make sure you showed me where the background was, I just keep missing it. Right in this area, they used to have more ships in the Brooklyn Navy Yard at certain times. They manufactured gun barrels here, and that's very important to know because they would yard them, and they would float them down the river. Now, in the early 20th century, early 1900s, they went down to Indian Head. We're going to visit Indian Head. After that, and I'll explain why, okay, they said, well, we need to move, we need to barge them further south. But um, the, one of the main, well, actually, the only heavy industry in Washington, D.C., okay, is right here at the Navy Yard. So they're repairing ships, they're building guns, okay, and they're testing munitions here. I like this photo because it shows you the cramped conditions that people used to work under. So the other thing is too that um, if you're familiar with the um, societal history of World War II, women took over a number of jobs that men had at the time. Men were all fighting, women took over the jobs, and then they were told to go home after the war. Very unfair, but unfortunately that's the way it was. Um, they're operating ladies. This is, this is a mechanic's job. These ladies are coming in and they're learning the skill. Anybody ever operated a lathe? Okay, not easy, right? These women are trained to do the same job as the men during the duration of the war. And they're living and working under these cramped conditions. Naval Air Station Anacostia. Remember I was talking earlier about all that open space? Well, 295 runs through here now and it's all built out. Okay, you wouldn't even recognize it. Well, for years, the Navy flew seaplanes out of here. Washington, D.C. was a happening place even before the war, okay? So you're manufacturing stuff, you're repairing ships, right? You're flying seaplanes, and in the early part of the 20th century, you actually fire munitions over the river, okay? So it was a happening place. Later, um, a lot of this uh, was moved further south later. Um, but the, uh, the Naval Air Station was there, I think until 1962, they finally decommissioned it because of uh, air traffic. 
build up over at Washington National and the fact that the area had become so congested. Mm. Flying Field at Anacostia, I used to drive by Bowling Field all the time. It was actually a Bowling Air Station. Um, Bowling, um, there was another designation for it one time. The earlier designation was Bowling Field, shared resource with the Navy. Opens on uh, 1918, becomes Bowling Airfield um, later on, and that's the name most people are familiar with. Again, uh, imagine, if you will, runways, I mean, all through this area, planes, okay, and then a lot of this activity moves south, down the Pax River later on, and some other uh, air stations further in the south. Naval Research Laboratory. If you look at this facility now, you don't even recognize it. You, you have to get a loop out just to find the original five buildings that were on this installation. Plus they have this really cool pier that goes out to the river. All right? This is where radar and sonar for the U.S. Navy was basically perfected. They also did uh, things with avionics, munitions. Uh, they had, by the time World War II rolled around, they were dealing with ten disciplines which supported the fleet. In conjunction with other facilities, uh, not just within the Potomac region, but within other regions along the eastern seaboard. All right, we're going to stop real quick because, like I said, we're running through this real quick. I know we're going to do questions at the end, but did any did I miss anybody's favorite so far? No. Okay, we're doing good. Let's keep trucking. All right, we're going to go from uh, Alexandria down to Quantico. All right. And most of these names should be familiar to people. The names are pretty much uh, uh, conveyed through time. We're going to start with the Naval Torpedo Station over in Alexandria. Has anybody ever been to the Torpedo Factory? Okay, well this is what it looked like back in the day when they were actually making torpedoes. And there's a picture of them actually um, finishing up on a torpedo. It's established in 1918 with the First World War. Uh, 10,000 torpedoes manufactured here during the war, actually up through 1946. Became a government storage facility. Uh, basically was abandoned after that. City of Alexandria bought it in 1969 and turned it into an um, art center in 1974. Now, I want you to remember this place because it's going to come up in further conversation. I included the Quartermaster Depot, which most people know as Cameron Station, only because when I was a young child, after we moved out of D.C., we moved to Alexandria, and I played along the shores of the Backlip Creek. The Army Quartermaster Depot was established at this location, and what you see here, this is the only, what, I keep hitting the wrong button. Don't, let's not get ahead of the story. These are the warehouses. This was the major function of the Quartermaster Depot, right? They built it here because of the access to the river, plus it was connected to a major rail hub in Northern Virginia. Later became a um, dog training facility and the defense logistics um, office moved in there. Uh, most recently what happened to it was uh, it was surplused off. Part of it went to the city of Alexandria as a park, and the other part was turned into uh, multi-use housing. But all of, the, all of this is gone now. This was the only picture I could find, and I did not get a chance to. If anybody from the Cameron Station Federal Government Employees Facebook page is watching, I apologize up front, but I did not get time to write you to see, can I share your photograph? I know. <laughs> write me up. Um, okay, Fort Hunt, Coast Defense uh, Installation. Uh, early part of the 20th century, basically end of World War I, it's obsolete technology and all the guns are dismantled and transferred elsewhere. Um, this is just one of the batteries that was over here, it was directly across the river from Fort Washington. I love you. <laughs> hey, I have the book too. Um, and that's a good book, by the way. Yeah. Yes, so you can come up here and talk about it later. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, this is one of the batteries. and. If you look at it now, it's a park, okay? And everything's wooded up. But back in the day, in order to fire artillery, you had to clear everything out. So everything was cleared out to the river, clear field of fire, clear field of view. Now, here's the interesting thing. 
right? Civilian Consultation Corps moves in in the 1930s, and then the government says, hey, we need a place to interrogate Nazis. Over 3,000 of them lived here during the war. Um, it was known by a post office box, 1142, that's the book that the lady just uh, held up. Then nobody knew about, the, or let me put it this way, people knew about it, but couldn't talk about it. So it wasn't until they did a, um, a uh, study back in the 1990s that it actually came to light. There have been two good books written about it, one I'm still looking for, the other one the lady has, we have it here, uh, is definitely worth a read because you know, remember earlier I was talking about no clashes on the river, no repelling of armies. Well, the Nazis were here, we just didn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay? And later on what happened was a lot of the German scientists were like, I don't want to go with the Ruskies. Right? So they were processed through here. Werner von Braun processed through here. Does anybody know who he is? Yeah. All right. I worked at NASA for 25 years. Him and Goddard, right? Only because Goddard got a station named after him. Uh, two big names in rocketry but Warner processed through here. The Adjutant General School of Fort Washington, um, Prince George's County, I love this postcard, and I actually volunteer with the National Park Service here for three years back in the 80s, so I've always considered this my home. Um, I just love the place, it's still there. Yeah. Um, all the buildings from the, from the um, early part of the 20th century were surplused off. Basically, the story is never a shot fired in anger at coast artillery installations. Um, the Army surplused it out, the part of the interior that said, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> we have a premium of space, we need the facilities, let's move the Adjutant General School here. And it ran there until 1944, when it was moved down to Camp Lee, Virginia. And they turned it back over to the Department of the Interior. Originally, it was supposed to be the end point uh, for another leg of the, um, the uh, highway, Mr. Schumann, help me out here, the highway that runs up and down the Potomac River. Right? Can you give me the name of that, sir? Because I'll be up all night. I'm sorry? No, that's the one that goes to Indian Head. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Clara Barton or George Washington? George Washington. There you go. Carl gets a cookie. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, I love the postcard. I, what work can I say? Over 110 buildings on the site, they're all gone now, except for, I think, the um, gymnasium and two NCO quarters. But the fort's still there, and it's beautiful in the spring and the fall. Okay, so I encourage you all to go over to Prince George's County and go see Fort Washington. All right, Fort Belvoir actually did some training here. Um, Camp A. A. Humphreys, established 1917, World War One. This is where they uh, trained personnel to run the narrow gauge railroads that they used over in Europe. Renamed Fort Belvoir 1935 for the Belvoir Mansion, which was on the property. All well, the remains were on the property. Right, um, became the uh, training center for all the Army engineers on the East Coast. And during the war, they trained 147,000 engineering troops. A lot going on down at the river. And this was actually built on a farm uh, that was owned by George Washington. He owned a lot of property over on the Virginia side of the river. Indian Head, Charles County, 1890, they established a proving ground in a powder production facility down at Indian Head, basically to perfect smokeless powder. What we see here is a lady working on a machine that's extruding what, what the caption says is powder, but it's actually socket, solid rocket propellant. Okay? A lot of things going on at Indian Head. What happens is that there were some incidents um, right around 1918, 1919, where the government said the ordinance is getting uh, more powerful, the ranges are getting longer, we need to move this. So we're gonna talk about uh, Indian Head again. But their mission expanded, they got into um, solid rocket propellant, they're still there by the way, right? Um, they have two facilities across the river, one deals in uh, explosive ordinance, I think that's Stump Neck, and I actually did a couple weeks there and they, uh, when I was in the guard. Um, you were talking about um, Indian Head Highway, Maryland Route 210, constructed. At one point, this place was pretty much isolated, out in the middle of nowhere. They constructed it, Access Road in 1943. Marine Corps Base Quantico, what can I say? Home of uh, amphibious doctrine uh, in the Marine Corps. They anticipated a war with Japan early in the 1930s. They established facility, and this is where all the island hopping um, 
planning, not only say planning, but the, but the, the doctrine. It's like, what do we need to do to invade islands in the Pacific? A lot of that work was done here. Um, when that facility left in 41, the center became a uh, place where it still is today, where they educate individual Marines and not large groups anymore. This is a picture of the barracks in 1929, still under construction. All right, we've got three more. Think we can make it? Let's do it. All right, U.S. Naval Prairie Ground down at Dahlgren, the Torpedo Testing Range, and NAS Beachville. And you're like, what the heck is that? There's a reason I included it. I love this picture. One of the few colored pictures of them actually doing uh, proofing at Dahlgren. Now, remember we said they moved a lot of things downriver. Word, and it's getting bigger, ranges are getting longer, things are more powerful, right? Well, they had an incident with a gentleman named Mr. Swan where they put an inert projectile to his front living room. And you got to see the pictures because it's like there's a big hole in the house and they got pictures inside and outside, the shelf sitting in the front yard. <laughs> right? Um, we don't know if he would have made a plant out of it or not. Okay? But it was pretty much the last straw. Okay? Um, we actually have maps that show the danger zones because there were restrictions on navigating on the river during certain times, during certain testing. Not just on the Potomac, but over here on the Tuxin and down in Solomons. So this is a um, test firing 8 inch gun. There's 12 inch projectiles on the bottom. There's 12 inch barrel to the right. It was a lower station uh, to Indian Head until it became, and you know what? The official name's not even Dahlgren. You know why they named it that? Because that was the name of the post office. So everybody knows it as Dahlgren, right? Well, Calvert County, a lot of it's the same, right? Didn't have a name until somebody said, well, what's the name of the post office? Okay, we'll go with that, right? Um, it was the, um, after the war, well actually during the war they became involved with uh, computational science in computers. They had some of the earliest computers uh, in use by the Navy. And now they're a specialty station, okay? Um, electronics and naval surface warfare. And Colonial Beach is a really cool place to go to if you want. It's right across the river and you can go right by the river. All right, I love this picture. now. Torpedo test range down at Piety Point. So remember when we were back up in Alexandria mm -hmm. and they're building torpedoes? Where do you think they sent them? Yeah. That's right, they sent them down river. Let's send them down to Piety Point and they can fire them into the river. Okay. Now, this test barge here is um, actually up in Newport. The uh, YTT2, which looked very similar to this, we have some pictures, but they're so grainy, I would embarrass myself by sharing them with you. But they had one of these down at Piety Point. Um, Naval Heritage and History Command actually has some really good pictures on their website which show the internal workings of it. Remember we were looking at the lathe shop up in the Navy Yard? If you want to talk about cramped quarters, the barges were much worse. Okay? But you can see right here, torpedo going into the water. And if you go over here, we actually have a picture of a guy retrieving one. He's got it tied to the side of his boat and he's taking it back. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why they're complaining, like, there's all this stuff out in the river, and the Navy's like, no, we brought everything back, and they're like, no, it's still out there. There's still lawsuits going on about this, by the way. Right. Um, but Piney Place is a beautiful place. I love the museum. The people down there are great. All right, we're going to end up here. Could not find a period photograph. Why don't I include it? Because I worked with Naval Protective Services for three years at Webster Field, which is out in the middle of nowhere. If you didn't know where it's at, you're not going to go buy it, right? So basically, go to the end of uh, nowhere and turn left. <laughs> um, it uh, was established as an outlying field basically for Pax River. We're not going to talk about Pax River today because we're definitely out of time. But um, the idea was you wanted an auxiliary field. So if the enemy came in, remember I was talking earlier, we were definitely afraid of the enemy invading, right, coming in with their own attacks. The idea was everything's out of Pax River. Somebody comes in, they're getting ready to bomb the base, fire on the base, whatever. Disperse your aircraft to other airfields. Beachville was one of them, okay? Uh, plus it's a pretty cool site, and now they do uh, avionics, engineering, electronics, and that's the mission uh, that they were doing uh, back when I worked there. All right, so that's the tour, okay? Now we're gonna wrap this up, put it back in a historic context. The war did not end conflict. And I always tell people that, I always end my presentations, I always end my exhibits on the fact that Things don't end when the armistice is signed. So World War II, a lot of displacement, even the Allied victory, kicking out the Germans, kicking out the, Japan, the Japanese from occupied territories, basically introduced the world we have today. We are still living with the legacy of World War II. And we have.
Korean War, Vietnam War, the issues over in the Middle East right now, Palestinians and Arabs fighting, Russians and Ukrainians, it's another story for another day, the Cold War, does anybody remember that? Okay, all right. Um, and a very real specter of World War II, which again is another story for another day. But anyway, um, it is only appropriate that um, we, we look back at things in the context in which they occurred. Um, again, this was an introduction. We flew right through it, but I hope I got your interest today. What I want to invite you to do is not just go look at all the cool stuff. This is just some of our reference materials. If you saw something today that interests you, take a picture of the book. Buy the book. Not from me, but buy the book. Right? and read more about it. That's what we do. We go out and we introduce concepts to people. We'll talk with them. I'd be more than happy to talk with you like, more, but Grace Mary's given me that look and she's taken out the shepherd's crook. <laughs> <laughs> but I think she's going to let us hang out for a few minutes. So, she normally does this, but I'm going to do it because I don't want her to get up. She looks very, doesn't she look comfortable? <laughs> she's very comfortable. How'd you like the presentation? I feel like my mouth has been marching through the Mojave. I'm so dry now. But we're going to do questions and answers. And we're going to sell your book. Um, oh, just remind else? everybody that they can see this on YouTube. Oh, because okay. I saw people taking pictures of right. different slides. Yep. Give it a couple of weeks and maybe you'll have it up on YouTube under the Bayside History Museum webpage. Excellent. Everything Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> and the cool thing is, you can get out your loop and read the slides. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay, without getting too specific, without challenging some of the numbers, which I said no two sources agree. Can I answer anybody's questions today? Yes, sir. Carter Rock uh, testing place. Uh -huh. David Taylor. Is it? You said it's still there. It's do still you, there. Do they do tours or things like that, like for the, or is it? Wow, that I do not know. Um, I stopped there back in the '90s, <clears throat> and because I was working with the federal government, I was able to get access to it. Um, they do have a website, okay, and you can inquire through the public affairs office. Cool. It is very cool, and it's multiple basins. Like I said, it's I think it's almost a half mile long. Um, after the alteration they did during the Second World War, yes, yes, Matt. Was there any threat of um, the Germans coming up the Potomac? The closest I believe they got was the mouth of the Chesapeake. They were sinking ships all up and down the East Coast. Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, they did plant mines down at the uh, mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but what we have to remember is the United States is completely unprepared for war. We're like, we don't want to get involved. Okay? We're not focusing on Europe. We're looking at Japan. That's where our interests are in the 1930s. Right? We're tracking what's going on in Germany. Okay? But Germany never had a, a Navy commensurate with the Brits. The Brits were the kings of the sea at the time. Okay? Our Navy, uh, we were playing catch-up because of arms limitation treaties emanating out of the First World War. But what we have to remember is reality and perception are two distinctly different things, which are both influenced heavily by your fears. And the fear was that the German Navy or Air Force could conduct an incursion into the eastern United States, maybe not Washington, D.C., okay, but these installations that we talk about, the coast defense installations, uh, anti-aircraft installations, all up and down the eastern seaboard. Right. They did land seven tours along Yes, the they did. Yes, sir. Can I add a couple of things? You are more than welcome. Bowling Field was a dairy farm, and it was basically confiscated from and family name off. Yes. And that's how it was there. Um, down at Quantico, after the war, up into the, up into the 50s and stuff like that, they had a very big monstrous hangar, and it was a complete rebuild system for airplanes. They would disassemble the airplane up in the upper stairs. Right. And down in the basement, they had different repair facilities that would repair different instruments of the airplane. Now, down at Piney Point, there's a German submarine that has been sunk, yes. and there's an official dive site with cameras onto it 
and it's been welded all up so that people can't get into it. But it's, it's one of five submarines that the, uh, um, the American forces were able to confiscate from Germany after the war. Thank you. Remember I earlier, was, I surveyed that site. Remember earlier, I was talking about we had to get this down to 45 minutes. This is the original presentation. <laughs> okay. With, without the introductory slides, oh, wow. right? So the area that this gentleman is talking about, including the target ship Hannibal and a couple of other things out in the bay that are pertinent, we were not able to get to today. But they're here. Just want to let you know I did do the research. Thank you. <laughs> hey, yes, sir. Is it possible to make your presentation longer and you can talk about Absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we want you to. No, you know what's really cool is that, you know, I. Like I said, I've been doing this so long, and it wasn't until somebody introduced the concept of taking what I've learned, and I continue to learn. I just finished one of these books this week. I've been reading like a demon, right? And they said, they said, we'd like you to come down to St. Mary's and do a presentation. And I hadn't really thought about it. I do a whole lot of other things, you know, presentation exhibits, but I've never really thought about this. Once I started getting into it, like, I've got a lot of stuff, yeah. right? But we can't get it all in one Time. So, what was suggested to me by Vincent was, he goes, why don't you write a book? You're halfway there. <laughs> so, um, we may be able to work something out with the Bayside History Museum to host the current version. Actually, I could do the extended version that will cover all the stuff we weren't able to include today, right? Um, but I sort of, kind of, I've never written a book. <laughs> but. Somebody told me it was easy, so why not, right? <laughs> um, so sometime before, yes, Mr. Shillet. Oh. The um, picture that you showed of the Washington Navy Yard ladies, uh -huh. the second lady in there was my grandmother. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. Right. I want to see where he got his good looks from. Oh. <laughs> what good looks? Stop it. I can tell that you, Pat, without even looking. So this lady right here. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, I love connection. Just now. Do we have any information about the role of the Coast Guard in the state and the second world Um You know, I was thinking about the Coast Guard this week because I have a lot of information about them up in Baltimore. Um, they also had a contingent down at Pax River Naval Air Station because I used to bust coasties all the time coming drunk through the gate. Um, <laughs> no, I have some very good friends over in the Coast Guard. Thank you. Semper Paratus, by the way. Um, I have not researched that branch of the service for this region yet, but it is on the radar. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 The only thing? <laughs> keep going, keep going. Don't hit him yet. Hit him after the fact. One of the things. Go ahead, sir. Okay. What I was referring to was our own news because I guess I got my words twisted. That's okay. I do. With the tiny point with the torpedo testing. Right. And all I could think of doing it was like, they didn't do a very good job of testing, considering how the number of failures. The failures. Are I've actually, really I've actually read the test reports, and you and wonder how we sunk anything sometimes. Very <laughs> <laughs> serious for the first two years of the war. Uh, I come out of Absolutely. One of the reasons that they were testing was that our torpedoes in the Pacific were turning around. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So one of the reasons that they were. They were um, the equivalent of um, uh, high-end testing was to go retrieve them. Mm -hmm. They didn't retrieve all of them. There's several still down there on the bottom. And the, the idea was that if you bring it back, if, if it fires straight and true, great, we'll, we'll check it. But if it turns around, we'll check that too. <laughs> they were comparing the two. Right. And they, that's, it was simple testing, but it was ultimately they got it straight. Yeah. We saw a couple of ships. For the first almost two years of the war, was the problem with the torpedoes. The uh, people, the with the Navy, they kept blaming the crews. Right. Right. They didn't know. And it's funny, well, you say like the torpedoes are turning around. 
if the liquid submarine didn't make any difference, it wouldn't explode. No, that's right. That's right. right. Yes, exactly. They were terrible. Like I said, if you read the reports, the numbers are astonishing. And I don't have the report with me to put the numbers. Oh, yes. Um, any, yes, Grace Mary. Nothing. We have to. Yeah, we've. Okay. Let, let people talk to you while they look at the Sure. <laughs> I'm so glad we've had this talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much for being here.